Ready? Not yet. Oh, not yet. <laughs> yep, let's see. This show is not uh, sponsored by Cat TV. Not responsible for its content. <laughs> <laughs> There's a relief. <laughs> Always that hard disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Cab Notes for February 2019. I think I got that right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have an exquisite panel of people here to talk to us today about burning wood for heat. Um, there, of course, was some question about how appropriate this is in some quarters. But uh, at least we'll talk about how it's being done now. And uh, we have Bill Christian and Paul Dancero and Bill Botzow with us. So why don't we start out with you, Bill, and you can tell us a little bit about um, um, why we call it biomass. All right. Um, that's a, an interesting question because um, you hear it's said once in a while that wood, <coughs> burning wood produces just as much carbon dioxide or more carbon dioxide than burning oil or natural gas or coal. Um, and that's, an, uh, I think, a very important question to understand fully. And uh, I'll try to address that in just a minute or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, the biosphere is the active shell of the earth, uh, the oceans, the land, all the living creatures and the air. And that contains active carbon that's just constantly recycled over a few years to a thousand years, depending on if you're looking at a tree or a bug or whatever. Um, things naturally, um, plants take carbon dioxide out of the air and then they return it to the air when they decompose or when they burn, um, or when they're eaten by, um, by um, animals, um, which um, burn plants just the way we do in a wood stove. They're basically turning them into energy, um, breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. So, you, so our, our, the shell of the earth, just a few, a few miles deep, um, is the active carbon um, um, environment which has um, which um, the carbon dioxide in that or the carbon which is cycled between all the life forms and everything gradually over millennia um, it has been a fairly constant CO2 level gradually drifting up and down with the things that happen on, in, on earth over thousands of years um, we are now taking a new carbon out of that has been underground for um, hundreds of millions of years in the form of carbon, of, of coal, and natural gas and oil. We are digging that up and burning it and adding it to the air um, in massive amounts, a, a million pounds a second. Uh, we're just and that's um, has. Um, increase the CO2, which used to be uh, 280 to 320 parts per million, just very gradually going up and down over, you know, 10,000, 100,000 year cycles, um, and it has suddenly gone up to 407, and it's going and it's rising about two per year, um, which um, very definitely increases the temperature of the earth and what the effects of that will be, how fast it'll happen and whether the effects are good or bad or whatever has been debated. But that's the basic concept and burning wood, um, while it does release carbon dioxide, it turns the wood, the carbon in the wood into carbon dioxide in the air, burns, it burns oxygen and turns oxygen and carbon into CO2. Um, that does release CO2 but it will grow back, a, a tree will replace it. So if you harvested trees continuously and replanted them and didn't deplete the trees, the long-term effect on the CO2 in the air is, is zero. You don't change it. You're, 
that you, when you burn a tree, you release it. When the tree grows, it takes it back in. So we could do that forever and not change the level of CO2 in the air as long as we don't burn down all our, don't cut down all our trees and overdo it. So um, in that sense, I very vigorously assert that burning wood is sustainable and we could do it forever as long as we do it right. Um, but you know, people do have a point that you know, in the short term, if you burn a lot of wood, it's adding some CO2 to the, to the air. I mean, scientifically, you can say that's true. But if you look at the big picture down the road, um, I assert that that's much, that's extremely much better than adding new carbon to the air, which permanently raises it. Because when you burn coal, that go CO2 goes into that biosphere, and it will um, get recycled over millennia between as trees grow and, and die and, and all the various processes that happen. But you've increased the amount in that, in our, in our, um, our, biosphere, our air and water and land, and that will never come out. So if we keep increasing that, you know, that, that doesn't come back out. It could be taken out. You could turn carbon dioxide in the air into coal and bury it, but that is such an absurdly difficult thing to do compared to not burning it. Like if you have the choice of burning coal and then <laughs> turning the carbon dioxide in the air back into coal and burying it, that's like a why did you burn it in the first place? That's just absurd. So my big advocacy is to stop burning this stuff. I think I went over my two minutes. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's fascinating. So, Paul, do you try to teach the students at the school all that kind of stuff about how important it is to burn chips instead of coal? Uh, I know <laughs> I have collaborated with different uh, faculty members at the high school as well as the Career Development Center to showcase the wood chip plant oh, at great. the high school, what it What's bad in its capacities? I know it's been incorporated into a couple of the different classes as they do studies on, uh, you know, uh, looking into more renewable energy, looking into uh, ways to conserve. So uh -huh. I, I do try to collaborate, and I've been asked to at different points. Uh -huh. and I'm always willing to uh, give tour and explain uh, the functions of the facility and what it, what it provides to us. Oh, so, great! Um, Very good. Um, well, well, we. Ask Bill Botsal here, how it's been, he, how many years have you been heating your home with wood? Um, fundamentally since I suppose it would be 1970. Wow. With a few years off, but not exclusively. I do mm -hmm. have backup heat, that is oil heat that yeah. I use, but I uh, mm -hmm. uh, put up, faithfully put up my cords every year and work my way through them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what does putting up cords entail? Well, um, there's many routes to go. One uh -huh. is uh, have your own tools and go out and find a suitable, uh, you know, suitable biomass in your own property. Mm -hmm. Another way, of course, is there are a lot of firewood dealers around here. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we have to be very careful that they're very, very local to us. We don't want to move emerald ash borer around. Oh, wow, yes. Uh, uh, that's something to pay attention to. And, mm -hmm. and uh, don't take your firewood up to camp if camp is more than a um, you know, a mile or two from your house. You, you yeah. don't want to do that either, because hmm. uh, that is uh, that's going to be a real problem also on our forests. Um. You know, I would like to to comment, uh, you know, further in your discussion is that it's very hard for people to understand carbon um, in the air because you can't see it. But if you want to <coughs> see carbon in the air, look at a tree, because a tree grows into the air. It fixes carbon and you can literally see the branches and you can see how they grow. So you could look at it as if all the carbon in the air is being gathered into the structure of that tree mm -hmm. and you can literally see it. Uh -huh. So, th you know, maybe that would help people, um, you know, visualize, which is very important to us, what we really mean by carbon in the air. Hard mm -hmm. concept to understand things you can't see yes. always mm -hmm. uh, about. Something else I think on that same subject I think is pretty important is, is that what trees do you want to burn and what trees do you want to leave? Is that which part of that growth cycle is important? And um, I was reading a good book last uh, winter about, uh, about trees and 
you know, and how they actually maintain each other through contact with their oh, root yeah. systems, their leaf systems, and, you know, share resources, uh, especially the trees that grow many sprouts up. Uh, but mm. one of the things I learned from it was that um, your old growth mature crowning tree sequesters more carbon. So oh. the right kinds of thinning and the right kind of work, the thinning itself becomes firewood, but mm. what you leave can contribute to a healthier forest itself huh. by working towards having trees that can grow and to have full crowns. Uh -huh. And that also conversely supports much of the wildlife that we're seeing. Uh, we've all read recently about uh, what the insect apocalypse in which we're seeing a decline in insects. You see a decline in insects. You see a decline in birds. You see a decline in birds. You see a decline in pollination. Um, and that, that's, you know, that is ongoing. So one of the things we can do is manage our carbon resources in Vermont well, for our benefit, our own warmth. I mean, why do we have fires? We like to be warm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's nice to be have that place where you're toasty. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, and uh, to go on from there, mm -hmm. you know, to do a better job of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, we've been burning wood since I think '76, when the oil embargo came on. You yeah. know, the price of home heat oil went up, so we decided. Well, there's a hill across from us, and I guess we ought to ask uh, John G. McCullough, who owned the land at the time, well, can we pull out the dead wood? Sure. So when our kids were like 10, 12, 14 years old, on Saturday mornings, you'd all go up the hill and cut a log of appropriate length and put a rope on to it and tie it onto a kid and it pulled down two <laughs> logs every day, every Saturday. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Child labor logs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we might have gotten in trouble there. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting to me to kind of balance this you know, individual yeah. kind of use of yeah. biomass. You get a lucky warm. man to have your firewood uphill from your house, mine's downhill. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, I, we certainly were lucky that way, no question. It's much easier when there was snow on the ground too to pull those logs mm -hmm. down. But yeah. it was fascinating to me to have this contrast between our individual efforts to keep ourselves warm and what Paul's doing here at the middle school and high school with yes. wood chips. Yep. Yeah, give us a few sure. facts and figures um, about what goes on there. Well, I guess I'll start uh, when the new middle school was being constructed up on East Road. Uh, as part of it, studied and it was decided to incorporate a wood uh, wood chip biomass plant as as part of the heating. So, mm -hmm. in the winter time, that would take over as the primary heat source from late October to early April, depending on seasonal, uh, you know, temperatures. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a little warmer or cooler. It lengthens or shortens the front or the back end of those shoulder mounts. Um, so what was installed was a 6 million BTU per hour Hearst boiler by Messerschmitt uh, Manufacturing. Hmm. Uh, the facility itself is about 153,000 square foot uh, that we're trying to heat. Mm -hmm. And over the last four years, the average uh, wood chip consumption has been about 543 tons through the season. You know, sometimes a little bit more one season a little bit less. Uh, oh. I've been in position now going my fourth year, uh, so just kind of maintaining the log and tracking that. Uh, the chips themselves are uh, hardwood chips. They're 30% mm -hmm. moisture content. Yeah, I right. brought a small sample uh, at the front of the table. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you want to take a look at yeah. it. Um, and our supplier right <laughs> now is Gagnon Lumber uh, up out of Pittsburgh, Mass. Yeah. And they've been supplying us for uh, you know, uh, I think it's at least the last eight or so years. I have to uh -huh. look back at the records. Um, and I, mean, I guess the biggest advantage, and you have to kind of, I guess, understand the, uh, you know, what does one ton of chips provide, mm -hmm. you know, in, for, in, in terms of heat. And, uh, you know, the figure is you can get out of 30% moisture content and assuming your boiler efficiency, uh, you should get somewhere around 8.95 million BTUs of energy out of one ton of chips. Um, mm. Now where that comes into bigger significance is like our backup system is number two fuel oil just for whatever reason if you know the wood chip plants uh, goes down for a period of time for maintenance or mm. or if it's in the shoulder months where we really can't burn efficiently you know like early October or late uh, you know 
or early fall or late spring, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we have to use the oil. But number two, fuel oil has an efficiency of about point, uh, or 0 0.115 million BTUs per gallon of fuel. So those are the, the numbers, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it, simplifying it into terms of basically for right now, for what it costs for when I'm paying a ton of chips, I can get about $8 per million BTU uh, out of the chips, whereas on number two fuel oil at current pricing, I'd be closer to $19 per million BTU. Wow. So, you know, it's less than half the yeah. cost uh, within current pricing. Now, of course, current pricing oil is low, so when I'm saying current pricing, I'm, I'm quoting about $2.25 for my last bulk delivery of mm. oil. Um, uh, per gallon, you know. yeah. But of course, you know, years that will, you I know, fluctuate that. greatly. When you know, several years ago, when oil was closer to three dollars a gallon, mm -hmm. you know, your savings was that much mm -hmm. more. Uh, so overall, then at the middle school, um, at the at the end of the day, I basically it costs, you know, for the heat season, you know, assuming 180 days mm -hmm. from that October to April, uh, you know, late October, early April, you know, it, it costs basically almost. Two hundred thirty-seven dollars a day for the middle school using the wood chips. If I was doing oil, it would be closer to about five hundred fifty dollars a day. Oh wow! Yeah. As, you know, assuming the pricing that mm -hmm. we're we're quoting there. So, so all all that to say, you know, we have significant uh, savings each year at the middle school when we're on the wood chips, and uh, right now forecasting that savings will be slightly over fifty thousand dollars for this heat season. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was the history on the middle school. Mm -hmm. After a year of operation and study, uh, the decision was made to install a wood chip uh, biomass plant at the high school as well. Uh, and that was in uh, uh, 2006. Um, went before the town as initially as a bond of a cost of, I think, $2.245 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, looking back at the records, I, th I think that was the quote on the, on the price. Um, and that was going to place an 11 million BTU Hearst boiler, again by Messer Smith, manufacturing the same same one. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the high school and the CDC building as one facility, right. much a bigger plant <clears throat> was needed oh, right, right. Uh, to do that. Uh, in the past four years, the average consumption at the high school has been just over 1,100 tons of chips a year. Some seasons, of course, a little bit less, a little bit more, but it's been you know, the four-year average, uh, burning the same chips. And at the end of the day, uh, the savings and costs, it looks like, um, you know, we burn, uh, depending on the temperatures, anywhere from four and a half to five and a half tons of chips per day yeah. at the high school. Middle school, I um, should have mentioned, was close to about three to three and a half ah, okay. tons, depending on, you know, on the temperatures. Uh, but all that to say, you know, the cost for the high school on wood chips is somewhere close to about four hundred twenty dollars a day, as an approximate number. Hmm. Whereas again, if we were on oil, it'd be closer to nine nine hundred eighty five dollars a day. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, again, yeah, significant savings. Um, you know, just on the cost, but then as far as renewable energy and, and also supporting a Vermont company, um, oh, right. you know that mm -hmm. you know those are all the other benefits that we. Uh, have from the wood chip plants and mm -hmm. you know it's a it's my first time being exposed to wood chip plants and yeah. uh, being part of it, but learn quite a bit and they are a very effective system uh, very little uh, maintenance required other than mm -hmm. you know every two days clean out at, you know shut down for a little bit let it cool down some clean out the ashes uh, each plant has a scrubber to do the fine ash out of the air as well oh really you know so you have the, the main firebox clean that but then there's a as part of the exhaust system there's the scrubbers that okay. draw out the fine particulates yeah so uh, they've got the stack correct <clears throat> so we try to be as clean as burning as we can as well where does the ash go uh the ash uh at the end of the day we just could dispose on site there's no uh, on site yep yeah, yeah. uh, well at the high school just on site more room mm -hmm. uh, middle school as well so it's not a no no tax toxic chemicals or anything else just the carbon from the wood burning and we're able to dispose. And it ends up being um, on a clean out, typically like one uh, normal trash, uh, like galvanized trash can. So 
like 30 or 40 gallon trash can of ash is that you it? know originally the uh, vermont settlement pattern in many mm -hmm. places was somebody had come in and cut mm -hmm. down all the trees mm -hmm. and burned them to sell the potash mm -hmm. to get enough money to buy the cow or the sheep mm -hmm. to then be able to do uh, that particular form of farming so uh, the ash itself at one point it was being sh mm -hmm. gathered and shipped and mm -hmm. i suppose there's no market for that right now i'm not sure <laughs> Yeah. Well, the egg laying committee up there. Well, they, they have used some. Yeah, that is a good point. They have used that, and it has been a corporate. Yeah, mm -hmm. has been a corporate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Bill, uh, <clears throat> reflecting on this kind of heat, uh, do you think it would be feasible in some parts of the community to have a communal chip burning system for maybe a row of forty or fifty houses? Um, I think that's a great idea. That's something that was done in Europe um, since they basically, since they started making electricity in the late 1800s. What they did was when you, um, when you make electricity by burning fuel, and that includes coal, wood, natural gas, and uranium too. Uh, I mean, basically you're, you could think of uh, you're not exactly burning uranium, but it's giving off heat, uh, just like if you were burning something. And so if you have a heat power plant that makes electricity, most of the energy goes up the chimney. Uh, hmm. Well, actually, it doesn't, technically, it doesn't, only some of it goes up the chimney, and the rest of it goes to condense the steam when you make the electricity. And there's no way around that. Like, um, most power plants are 35 Forty percent efficient. Some modern um, gas plants are claimed to be up to sixty percent. But so someone says, "Oh, this nuclear power plant's only thirty-eight percent efficient. That's terrible. Why don't they improve it?" But actually, thirty-eight is very reasonable. You, it, there's no way around the fact that most of your when you when you generate electricity, most of the heat you use to generate it, or a very large part of it has to be condensed to run the cycle. It's just a part of it. It's not inefficiency, really. It's like a, a, a physical law, a law, law of nature. And so, um, so in Europe, being very smart, <laughs> frugal, maybe poorer than we were at the time, they said, let's put our power plants right in the cities and use the waste heat. Um, and so, um, mm. Paris and Moscow and London all had, um, they were burning coal generally in, with, in power plants close to the middle of the city and they would, the heat um, heated the whole area. Um, see that's mm -hmm. the heat that would, would otherwise be wasted. The co um, cooling towers, you see the mm -hmm. cooling towers on nuclear power plants, the, those amazing giant <laughs> things that sort of say nuclear, but actually a lot of coal power plants have the same thing. Um, and um, natural gas ones usually might use much smaller ones, but you always have this plume of steam. It's not, it's not um, smoke, it's actually steam, mm -hmm. heat. This, you're getting rid of the heat. Um, and instead of having a big cooling tower, send the heat throughout the city and warm all the buildings. It's like free mm -hmm. energy. Actually, you can sell it. And so make, your, make the whole huh. system more profitable. And being profitable can mean being efficient. Um, so, um, so com that's called um, combined heat and power, and it's also known as cogeneration. Uh, and that's oh. an extremely smart thing to do, and it's it's hardly ever done in the U.S. Be because originally the utilities didn't want the competition; they just wanted to put in their power plants and not they they just kept it. Um, there were laws about not combining them, which is a pretty outrageous oh, thing. When something makes sense and it's more efficient and you outlaw it, that's, that's <laughs> something that drives me crazy. So um, small uh, combined heat and power um, plants seem like a really smart thing to me um, in cold climates. Um, if you put a, a little power plant uh, you know, at the hospital or at the school or downtown or or combined with this big Putnam project or something where, mm. where you have um, 50 or 500 buildings in a, you know, in a few blocks, you know, a com compacted downtown where it's worth piping heat mm -hmm. around. 
you're not really going to send um, you know, you're not going to be sending heat all down through Pownall. Uh, that the economics are pretty poor. Uh, but any place you have a, a village or a town, to put in a, a power plant that heats the town with wood and produces electricity as a byproduct, or whichever one you look at as being primary, um, mm. that's it's a very smart is a much smarter use of fuel, and it also provides electricity during the time of the year when we don't have as much renewable energy. We want, you know, Vermont has a goal and actually a kind of a law that we are going to reduce our use of um, fossil fuel to 10%. We're going to be 90% renewable by 2050. And 2050 is not a long time from <laughs> here. I have figured out as I've gotten older, time flies. Um, so um, in November, December especially, we get very little sun around. Uh, the whole of the Northeast doesn't mm -hmm. get much sun. We get more sun in January, February. We start getting bright days. So it's not the temperature, it's the sun. But November, December, if you're relying on solar energy, you're not going to get very much. So if you're burning wood and heating the town, you're reducing the use of electricity for heating. And we, we hope to do more electric heating with heat pumps to as a way to stop burn, using oil and gas and propane. So um, that early winter to be running, to be providing 24 hour baseline um, valuable electricity when there isn't much available by burning wood and heating the, the community. This seems like such a smart idea. And that's done, there are a few hospitals in the Northeast. Hospitals use an awful lot of energy um, mm -hmm. year round. There are some hospitals that have wood-based combined cycle systems like that where they're using the heat and the electricity together and burning wood, wood chips. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, like two or three, maybe four hospitals in the Northeast that do that and are very happy with it. And mm -hmm. that same model could be used. Um, uh, these, there's an economy of scale, the bigger, yeah. the, the more cost effective it tends to be, but I could see a, a something running at, at a place like Bennington cost effectively. If we, you know, if we really want to do this, that would be a pretty smart plan in, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. So that's uh, that's combined heat and power. In yeah. So Bill, your experience in the legis legislature has uh, have you <coughs> noticed that the legislature over the years has been trying to make <coughs> you know efficient energy, you know more yeah, available. Bit. You mentioned uh, setting aspirational and hopefully technically practical goals out there, mm -hmm. and along the line of what you're talking, as I believe it was in the. Capital bill last year is the McNeil power plant mm -hmm. uh, in Burlington will now be working towards shipping heat as well mm -hmm. into, uh, I think, probably larger institutions in Burlington. I think mm -hmm. the re-engineering of the current system often ends up as a place, well, how do we actually do this? Yeah. The theory is mm -hmm. there if you were to build a new town, a new city. Um, or mm -hmm. totally revitalize an area. It's interesting mm -hmm. you mentioned the Putnam block that way. So those are some examples. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when you're talking about the use of wood and heat, you're talking about a very long um, continuum of policy activities that go all the way back to forest fragmentation oh. to make sure mm -hmm. that you actually have a forest mm -hmm. that is harvestable um, and that uh, and now legislature is working on that as we speak. It did mm. last year and the year before, uh, because mm. what we're seeing an awful lot is that the forest gets chopped up, and then the foresters can't put together a large enough parcel to make it economically viable to uh -huh. go in and do uh, their sustainable forestry work. So uh -huh. th those are a couple examples. Mm. There, are, there are more either. There's obviously the, mm. um, the work on. Uh, the various forms of renewable that are out there. We're on wood today, but we're seeing mm -hmm. around here Bill Scully's work in small hydro. Mm -hmm. We're seeing yeah. um, work on solar and then the follow-up on solar siting to make sure that it fits mm -hmm. our community traditions and value. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so how, how real is this idea? <coughs> My wife keeps on complaining about, there's no sun, there's no sun. They're not not going to be able to have a garden. There's not enough sun. <laughs> So is, the, is anybody tracking that 
there are more cloudy days now than before? Is that going to reduce the viability of solar power or even growing plants? Not by a lot. Um, our, our concerns about cl climate change, um, you're not going to see a large change in, in sun. Um, the, um, as the climate gets warmer, you get more clouds because you get more evaporation. Uh, which mm. partly compensates, like more clouds um, may capture heat, but they reflect sun. I mean, it's just an extremely complicated thing. But um, you're not going to see a large increase in clouds and a large reduction in sun. Um, we're seeing more extremes. Things are less stable, and um, and just the base temperature worldwide average is definitely climbing. But there are places where it's falling and places where it's climbing so much faster. And it's very, it's, nothing is, is extremely clear. It's a very complicated picture. But um, to say uh, it's going to get cloudier so solar won't work, I wouldn't, I'd say that's a pretty, um, I, that's not something to worry about. I mean, solar is hmm. a challenge because um, it, uh, in the Northeast, we don't get as much sun as, you know, um, Arizona, but mm. we get like two thirds as much as Arizona. It's not the dramatic change. I mean, most of the year we get quite a bit of sun. We get we these long sun. a little days. bit. We get more sun in the summer, but less in the winter right. than Arizona. Right, and so that's uh, that's the big challenge because we could do <coughs> 20, 30, 40 percent of our produce that much of our energy with solar with enough panels. Um, and, and daily storage, um, but um, seasonal storage to get through November, right. December, um, and get um, you know ninety percent renewables at that time is going to be a real challenge. Um, and there are other, um, there's a lot of other options. Uh, you know, combined heat and power, um, seasonal um, water power. Um, Quebec, mm -hmm. far, the far northern can Canada, has tremendous water power, and that's a really, I mean, that has some, every, every way of getting energy has its ups and downs, its pros and cons, um, and there are complaints about the scale of some of those jobs in far northern Canada, but that has the potential to produce an enormous amount of energy and it's you could think of it as being money in the bank because it's behind these enormous dams that, that can run for months. And so if we don't use as much um, of that water by using wind and solar and biofuels, we can hoard it and then use more of it in a rush at other times. It's mm. kind of like a giant um, battery up yeah. there. Um, and and other, other um, other water power projects as well have seasonal storage, but especially um, Canada has. Uh, so between that and you know, all our ingenuity, we, we could, um, we, we can do this and all the, the naysayers about how the sun doesn't shine at night and all of that. I mean, there are, there are um, ways around all of these things. It just, it costs money. Mm -hmm. If <coughs> this makes me wonder if uh, you're chip uh, production of heat is probably more than the school could use. What about the idea of you know, sending a, a little bit of that to various neighbors or? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the greatest challenge would just be how would you distribute? Mm -hmm. Like as a high school is a good example, the, uh, the chip plant was built, like I said, but it supplies just the main high school building, the CDC. Right. Doesn't supply the campus. Uh, now, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have to look back at the whys of what I suspect, though, is just the engineering cost. If we try to distribute and put the mm -hmm. lines to the other buildings, that mm -hmm. was probably what, or, or what was in the way of the lines going yeah. up, oh, right. you know, with, the, with other infrastructure. <coughs> right. But I think your, your real key point would be if it was a brand new development facility, community, or housing project, then it's definitely a viable option right from the start because you can then... Uh, mm -hmm. you know build it in initially and you get the distribution mm -hmm. um, you know the, the other would just be the of course distances you know you have yeah. your loss over your over your lines just how much 
you know lost what you have and how much is available mm-hmm. yeah um, I often wonder about that <coughs> right. in relation to Benning College I mean their yeah. whole campus I understand is pretty well heated yes from that, uh, yeah. from, what I, from what I understand as well uh-huh. okay. but the uh, is also I think what I believe though know, it's a steam system throughout mm-hmm. whereas I'm just doing the hot water I see like traditional uh, hot water radiation uh, uh-huh. radiators and all type of thing oh, yeah. through the buildings mm-hmm. And the the college probably I, I it's funny I don't know more about this but the college probably had a central plant before and just converted it to wood so they had all the pipes mm-hmm. oh, yeah. in the ground because putting putting new yeah. pipes and yeah. digging across all your parking lots and all yeah, that gets, fun, that gets really that gets challenging <laughs> it, it, it can be done but yeah. mm-hmm. again it's, it, it's but if you have an existing central plant it's converting yeah to convert that to mm-hmm. uh, you can add um, Combined power and heat to a central system. It, it, it's you know, that's a it's a pretty major project, mm-hmm. but it, there you've mm-hmm. got the distribution existing. It's not, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but you will reduce the capacity if you're if you're burning um, a thousand tons of wood and you make electricity. You're dropping. You're not going to get the whole. It's not free electricity. You're actually stealing some of the heat. So if you burned a, a thousand tons of chips and you made electricity you'd only be getting um, like 600 for heat and mm-hmm. then because the rest is actually going it's it's leaving in the form of electric power um, so um, but it's still worth it uh, electricity mm-hmm. is more valuable mm-hmm. than electricity than um, mm-hmm. than than wood you know um, per BTU it's much right. more expensive much more valuable and it can run a heat pump with a um, like a two to one to six to one advantage. Mm-hmm. So you, you're using less electricity to make heat with the electricity you made from the chip. So it's, it's a matter of getting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, uh, and if it was um, economically driven, if people made the best economic decisions um, rather than um, sort of trying to legislate everything um, uh, procedurally, like what kinds of rebates do we give for what kinds of measures? Um, the the bottom line is that if energy costs more, will if, if oil and natural gas and coal cost more, we'll just naturally look for all the other options and we'll do it in whatever is the most cost effective way. I'm a really big advocate of that. The the famous carbon tax is that mm-hmm. if um, I mean, it, right now, if um, if oil dropped to a dollar a gallon, then it could, we could be in the point at the point where oh, let's stop burning the chips. We can save energy. We can save money by burning oil instead. Mm-hmm. So and the and the and the re- the um, reverse of that. At one point, oil was four fifty, mm-hmm. pushing five dollars yeah. a gallon at a sh- at for a little while. At that mm-hmm. point. You'd be crazy not to switch mm-hmm. to wood. So if we want everybody to switch to wood, make oil five dollars a gallon. <laughs> and I'm not saying to do that immediately because that it, that's too hard on people, causes mm-hmm. real hardships, loss of jobs, real, real human problems. But if you move gradually and steadily, predictably in that direction, you know, right now if somebody's oil boiler dies and they look at the cost of an automatic wood pellet system mm-hmm. or the cost of just replacing it with oil, they're going, chances are they're just going to replace it with a new oil system because it's a lot less expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they looked at it and said, the well, initial cost. yeah, the initial cost. But if you said, well, I need a new you know, $7,000 um, boiler, my old Will McLean gave up the ghost, um, and do I want to spend another 4000 for a, a nice automatic pellet system? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, oil's two twenty a gallon. Uh, yeah, I don't really have four thousand more to spend. Forget that. Put in the oil. But if um, oil was three dollars three fifty, and you know it's going up ten s- cents a year, uh, I, gee, I, I think I'll, I'll find th- I'll find that four thousand dollars. I'll get a loan, and I'll come out ahead. Even if I get that loan, I'm going to save that, get that back. So that's, and that just makes everyone make smarter decisions you know maybe it isn't a a a pellet stove maybe it's a heat pump but 
it's it's saying don't just put in a new oil boiler because that's not what we want. We don't. You put in an oil boiler today, it'll probably be running in 2050, and it's not supposed to be. <laughs> so you're buying something that you shouldn't. Uh, you know, it'll be fine for a few years, but that's not what we we want to. We don't want those anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's the key point. The, the life cycle cost yeah. is really what you have to look at. Mm. And I, I know I, I always do it you know, at school as well. But the, you know, combined, you know, just this year alone, the uh, you know, anticipated savings between the middle school and high school is on the order of about $150,000 versus if we were just on oil the whole time. Mm -hmm. And that, mm. you know, so that, and that's in today's price. And then, of course, if I look at the cost from what it was when the high school plant was initially built, you know, to now there was years there was much greater savings just because mm -hmm. of that disparity of between how much oil had went up to and what chips were costing at the time. Mm -hmm. So it definitely has paid for itself, <coughs> yeah, you know, and, and just a, a, t a ten to twelve year return. You know, and mm -hmm. going back to the old carbon yeah. tax, if oil had cost two twenty back when they made the decision, they probably wouldn't have put in the chips. They put on those yeah. chips probably when it was a bit more than it is now. I'm not sure about the dates on that. Uh, but, but I mean, the threshold right now uh, would have to be, oil would have to be under a dollar a gallon mm. for what I'm paying on chip price. <laughs> so, Guess you're pretty safe there. So yeah. It, yeah. It, With all the changes that are mm -hmm. suggested, um, and they're probably all fine, but you have to be very careful that the people that are impacted by it are mm. not unduly impacted. Yeah, absolutely. So that if you're going to raise money here, you've got to distribute it there right. so that people are held even, especially mm. rural populations. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a big concern. Absolutely. Uh, um, I think that uh, we also should be recognizing, we're talking, the bottom line here is how do you stay warm? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can stay healthy, so you can be productive. And um, mm -hmm. we ought to also be talking about some of the work Efficiency Vermont has been doing to help regular homeowners, mm -hmm. not big institutions, but mm -hmm. them too also mm -hmm. with <coughs> cold water heat pumps, for example. Uh -huh. And now I learned, I wish I had more detail for you, um, is that they have a wood stove replacement rebate uh, that would lower the price of replacing your old dirty wood burning stove with a clean one with a catalytic converter. And they've identified dealers around Vermont who mm -hmm. will um, work with you to do this. And one mm -hmm. of them is, uh, the name of the business escapes me, but it's right up here on North Sea Side Drive. It's the place that sells uh, a lot of uh, wood equipment, but also the pool equipment. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. if, you, if you know of them, as they're authorized, you could go with them and work with them on replacing your stove that doesn't have a catalytic converter that may be too old. And what I read, the rebate's like a thousand bucks. Wow. But the price of the new stove is probably three, four times that. Mm -hmm. So you are gonna get a big reduction, but now you're working on air quality and more efficiency and getting more heat actually out of the wood. Um, because I think we need to remember that who do all of these ideas apply to? And as people mm -hmm. living in apartments, as people living in houses, as people who are trying to maintain a second dwelling, as people who don't have a lot of resources to put into it one way and what are the strategies that are going to make it able for them to stay warm in, in an efficient way because, gee, it sure is easy to have the oil truck back up to your house, put the oil in the tank, and just set the thermostat, which you can even now do on your smartphone <laughs> you're right. that everybody has. So you're right, it is a market, and people should compete in that market, but that market has to be fair, right. governed and governed uh, mm -hmm. across the board. There is a company up north, though, that has been working on delivering pellets to your house and to your boiler in the system, so you don't have to lift bags. And you don't have to move yeah. bags. And they've actually started doing it. Um, it's, uh, and that is uh, also promising, too. Mm -hmm. So that's very similar to the mm -hmm. oil delivery person yeah. you know, as well. A lot of these things are coming. We have to persevere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> talking about how you keep your place warm, and how much of a chore do you consider it to be? To, well, first of all, how do you get all the wood you put in your stacks? Do you get somebody to come and deliver us? 
Well, no, I like the stack word. I like it. You know, I look at it this way. Um, uh, you talk about exercise or whatever. I don't have a gym membership. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's something about deliberate work that you do on your own and having a taste for it mm -hmm. that frees your mind and allows you to think through the problems without stress. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, basic chores that come with living in our environment, such as uh, dealing with your wood piles, uh, dealing with your snow, dealing with your digging your garden, mm -hmm. uh, fills, the, fills that gap. For others, they have other things they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I probably ought to try some of them too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. But uh, so basically, I think it's just a matter of stacking it so it doesn't fall over mm -hmm. and stacking it in a place that you're not gonna bring bugs into your house. Mm -hmm. So it's close enough to get to yeah. it. And I think the other thing that's important is to give your wood uh, enough time to dry out. Mm -hmm. So if you're um, in this weather where we don't have a lot of snow on the ground, if you're out there doing a little work in the woods, um, it's a good time to be working not on next winter, but the winter after. Uh -huh. You ought to have next winter's <laughs> wood ready if yeah. you can. And drying, if you put it up last summer especially, because that amount of time will make it so that your fire will light just like that, as opposed to blowing on it and struggling it and <laughs> yeah. burning up newspapers and, and uh, all the various other, uh, uh -huh. you know, you're all <laughs> nodding your head. We know it. <laughs> yeah, we, we do have Hard to do, though. Mm -hmm. a, a moisture tester here. So what's the ideal moisture content of cordwood? The lower, the better. <laughs> like, if you had it down to four or six, would it be better than... Yeah, the, there's no low limit. The better it is, the oh, lower is that it right? is. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I've heard absolutely. it's good to have a little moisture in it. Lowers the, like the efficiency. Or something um, like that. I don't know. My, uh, I've heard people say if you burn wet wood, it burns longer. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's kind of like, a, like, <laughs> like if I walk with a weight on my foot, I get more exercise. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> definitely, every every yeah. pound of moisture in the wood. Is you ha you're you boiling it away, just it like away. making maple syrup. You're sending steam, you're turning water into steam and sending it up the chimney with, by using some of the energy out of your wood. So if you had a zero uh, moisture content, that would be great. You can't, because it'll only come down to equilibrium with the air. Um, so mm -hmm. um, in winter, it'll actually, it, you can dry it more in winter because the air is drier. But in summer, it's hotter and easier, and you're out in the sun and everything. But in theory, if you could, if you had your wood with, if you could bring your wood in and leave it for a long time inside, which isn't a really great thing to do, <laughs> it gets really dry inside mm -hmm. because your 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 house it, like will actually drop down to just a few percent of mm -hmm. um, moisture in 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 really cold weather. Huh. Well, just for fun, let's check some of these pieces okay. of wood here. <laughs> here, I'll give How you does this work? Oh, well, uh, you want to hand me that piece of wood there? Well, it just has these two prongs here that make the contact, and then you push this on the end. Yeah, in there, and it's supposed to give you a number. It's supposed to have <coughs> longer needles, I guess. Yeah, put it like this, then you can push down on it. Make okay, it easier. There we go. 13. That's pretty good. That's yeah. ready to go. Yeah, yeah. How about that piece of wood over there? <coughs> <coughs> and then you could I'll do our table. <laughs> okay, try the end there. <laughs> sure. 12. 12. 12. Oh, not bad. Yeah, how about that piece there? That's pretty, that's a pretty dry hunk. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you're fresh. Mm -hmm. These are fresh. Just yeah. Out of Nine. It bothers me that they use such Eight point nine. Chips, but this one feels it's very practical. Dry. To yeah. To try it. This one feels just. You can you almost see if I can get my that chips. Nine. Did you say? I don't know if that worked. Nine. Oh. Okay. Hey, Twenty percent. Yeah. Right on. Almost right on spec. Oh, so that's what. I, I would call for thirty percent. Roughly. Yeah. 
Well, it probably dry so pretty yeah. fast, just it like does. this. Yeah. So even just having that Let's out. See what for the a handle few hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is old and processed. Thirteen, twelve, mm. eleven. <laughs> huh. Well, it may have been outside. It was. Yeah, yeah. It was. If it got too dry, it'd be very brittle. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So you say you have a standard for your chips? Uh, we would call for a spec 30% uh, moisture content, which, uh -huh. you know, I also don't get a chance to measure it, but it's it's what comes in. And yeah. part of it, too, is how the, you know, uh, too much moisture content in it, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, depending on how cold it is outside, chips will actually freeze in the trucks oh, geez. coming in, yeah. or we'll have chunks in our, our bins, or our chip mm. storage bins. Uh -huh. So, you know, you want some moisture content, but you don't want, want too much, and, mm -hmm. and that's what it calls for. But that's, that was also part of the spec of uh, the boiler and the firebox themselves, oh. mm -hmm. you know, in, in the efficiencies we expect to gain. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a, a test, if you don't have one of these tools, um, you can weigh your wood and weigh it periodically. I took mm -hmm. um, three big typical chunks of wood um, a year or two ago that's I bought bought some wood uh, I try to do my own as much as I could but I bought a little wood and it, it looked pretty wet you know it's supposed to be dry and I didn't have a meter so I brought it inside these three three like ten pound eight pound pieces of wood and I put the three of them together on on a bathroom scale and I wrote down the weight mm -hmm. and then every couple of days I'd weigh it again and the weight just dropped and dropped and dropped you know it went yeah. from it started at 26 pounds and after a month it was like 19 pounds you know wow. it, so you know it just and you it gets slower and slower and it's going it's not going down to zero it's going down to whatever that um, equilibrium is so it's not as accurate as this but I could tell that it wasn't that dry because it lost quite a lot. Um, so, and I, I guess if you took, well, like these, you could dry those like in a frying oh, right. pan and yeah, get them just easy. toasty dry yeah. and yeah. weigh them and find right. out, really, you know, really they'll, you know, yeah. do a pound and see what it ends up as, you know, oh, half a pound, oh, that was 50% moisture. Yeah. Huh. So, but, um, but, but the less moisture, the better. And I guess with chips, it's just, it's not very, um, they cut them fresh and just right. deliver them, and they can't s afford to store and hold them for a long time. It's just too, there's, they're handling too much. I wish there was a way to, you have all that heat going up the, the flue, mm -hmm. and if you just dr dried the new ones coming in with the heat right. going out, you could have really dry chips coming in. Mm -hmm. But again, it's all about um, cost. Like you, say you saved 10% of your chips per mm -hmm. year by doing that. Uh, you're looking at a really expensive mm -hmm. gizmo right. in your stack, yeah. but you know that's something like that's theoretically possible. Mm -hmm. And these are all the things that we can look at as as we try to do more. If oil gets more expensive and we're looking for alternatives, uh, well, maybe we should dry these thing out, things out instead of burning them at thirty mm -hmm. percent. You know, that's th right. there's no need mm -hmm. for that economically right now, but you know, as we're trying to get more and more. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really don't want to cut down too many trees. Uh, like the, the the McNeil power plant is kind of frightening. Uh, the, there's a, 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 a big electric power plant in, what is it, up north somewhere. I've never been there. It's uh, in, uh, well, it's in uh, Burlington. Right in Burlington, it's okay. Right at, it's just yeah. uh, down on the river in okay. the Intervale. Mm. Uh, it well, is a big plant and the chips are brought in by rail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you you see the scope of it. Like a big mm -hmm. um, coal plant can burn hundreds of coal cars a day, right. uh, and you you know you look at the heat in a coal car. Right. Um, and another really <laughs> funny thing is the natural gas that's used mm -hmm. in power plants. It's about the same weight as the weight of the coal that is right. burned. So you are bringing in a staggering amount of gas. Just picture the weight of gas coming in equaling those hundreds of coal cars. They are bringing mm -hmm. in millions and millions of cubic feet per day. Mm -hmm. It's an, it's really, uh, you know, <laughs> whenever you're doing something really big, it's, uh, mm -hmm. so at, at any at any rate, the, the McNeil power plant, they burn an awful lot of wood. Um, and the idea of 
using small cogen systems throughout the state and keeping it sort of like not move not transporting wood too far mm -hmm. um, harvesting wood sustainably mm -hmm. i love the idea of local um pellet making and and uh, mm -hmm. you know we buy our pellets you know from canada or tennessee mm -hmm. or wherever uh, and if we um, like the old grist mills, uh, you know, every town ground its own wheat mm -hmm. and corn and everything. If mm -hmm. somebody opened up a little place where you bring your brush, you know, your uh, bring bring wood there, and they'll give you, you know, a hundred dollars a ton mm -hmm. or something for your wood, and they turn it into pellets locally, um, use water power <laughs> from mm -hmm. the river or whatever. Um, that um, I know there's all this economy of scale stuff, but if somebody could make a nice little efficient mm -hmm. ch uh, pellet maker, like why should we be bringing pellets from mm -hmm. you know, 600 miles away? Mm -hmm. This is a pellet, it's just a big one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, uh, and I just say that is that um, it really brings us back to people work with what they got. Mm -hmm. And they do the best they can. And obviously, mm. people have a chainsaw or a splitting mm. maul or, uh, and a, a sledge and everything that we have around here. But we aren't ramped up to make pellets in the same way that we are to uh, chop up food, for instance, uh, and various things. And I don't know if it makes sense. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Yeah. And I think we sometimes have to reframe the way we think to understand how what we actually do is similar and it's not that big a stretch to uh, do mm. that idea. Mm. So if I have um, somebody, and I bought wood for years from a um, great guy, actually uh, we lost him last winter, Roger Contois, um, but he brought me a lot of pellets and I had to stack them, but they were this big <laughs> in, a, in a sense. But it's mm -hmm. not that dissimilar, mm. right. except that it doesn't come in a plastic bag. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And it's local, right. mm -hmm. and it's a local economy, and you could work with local yeah. folks, and it was you know, good, honest work, too. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to support our, lo um, our local um, woodcutters, our local people in the forest, especially those that are wanting to concentrate on some of that secondary growth that really isn't of much use in uh, commercial markets. Right. And that would allow the, um, you know, the, the trees that could ultimately, once they re uh, reach the right maturity, you know, go to good oak, good maple, and, uh, you know, go out into the marketplace. There's a lot of the other wood that would you know, help that move forward if we're judicious about it and mm -hmm. um, thoughtful. Well, do either of you have a final statement you want to make? <laughs> I guess I just did. <laughs> yeah. that, that yes, that's, that's so. Yeah, just um, all of us doing um, what makes sense um, and um, and trying to think outside the box. Definitely, your your yeah. idea about well, uh, the the gym membership and cutting wood. Um, uh, that's that's <laughs> very close to my heart. I I um, I just can't stand running on a treadmill for no reason. Right? <laughs> it's just like, right. let's, do, let's get something done at the end of the day. But, but those things um, also, they're not as continuous. Uh, like I wish I could shovel snow or cut wood or whatever every day. I mean, they tend to be streaky, like I'll overdo mm -hmm. it and then I don't do anything for three <laughs> weeks. And that's not good either. But. Hmm. Now we have sort of a wood burners uh, support group, <laughs> right? <laughs> and have clever way to fill in those mm. those blank spots. Yeah. yeah, and of course you have to educate all the people in the high school about yeah. this thing. Yeah, and I just appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk mm. about the systems. I know it's uh, more on the commercial side or institutional side, but it's yeah. definitely, I, I, my opinion, you know, an option that's really benefited the local community because obviously all the savings that we're having is able to be applied in other areas in the budget overall budget. Mm -hmm. you know either improving the maintenance or other things so yeah it's you, you know a lot of what i get a second and third order effects mm -hmm. just from it so yeah that's a biggie mm -hmm. well thank you all thank very you. much thank you thank you, you. Thank you.